Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. If you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, you can tap or mouse over the video playback area of the screen to reveal the chapter titles and starting points of each section. In this week's podcast, I've got tidbits. I have some follow-up information on the 19th century stockings I showed you last week, and I have an update on my 1940s vintage sweater project. So let's get started. This first tidbit was posted in my Ravelry group a few weeks back, and then another person emailed me the link and I felt like I was discussing it. And then a third person sent me a link more recently and that's when I realized I hadn't actually shared this with you. What was shared with me so many times was a video about Ukrainian Tutsil ethnic minority. This was a video published by Business Insider. So this community, they are in Western Ukraine and they have been keeping a century old or centuries old weaving tradition alive. Uh, using the same tools and techniques and other tra traditional methods that their people have been using for generations. I love watching videos like this because you can see in what way a particular craft is done essentially identically to how it might be done somewhere else, but the design of the items they make are distinct to their tradition. But then they throw in a technique or a process that it's completely different from anything you might see somewhere else. And to me, that shines a completely different light on what they're doing. So I am going to leave uh, a link to the, it's a, a YouTube video uh, down in the show notes on these particular weavers. So what I found particularly fascinating in this video uh, was not just that they were spinning their own wool to use in the rugs, but that the techniques that they use to wash the rugs and fold them or kind of felt them to make them harder wearing was so different from anything that I had seen before. Uh, I really encourage you to watch this. It's, I think the video is less than 10 minutes long. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. This next tidbit came to me from Topher. If you have Netflix, you'll know that at the start of a show or a movie, there's this big red N that is their, their logo. And there, there's this kind of boom, boom sound. And then the, the letter N comes moving toward you, toward you, the viewer. And then it separates into these sort of individual colored lines that eventually just leave the screen entirely. There's a stop motion animator named Kevin Perry who decided to recreate that Netflix logo effect using inexpensive craft supplies. And the supplies he chose to use was yarn. So I, I really like watching these kind of behind the scenes footage of almost anything, but I really love seeing something like how stop motion animation is done. It's just, it's such a, a slow exacting process. And it's really uh, fascinating to see how he imagined this logo, moving logo in a three dimensional, a true three dimensional way and how he simulated that, um, that motion with his camera and all of his strings of yarn. So it's a, it's a short video. It's, I think it's less than seven minutes long. I'll leave that down in the show notes. This next tidbit came to me from Twitter. It's a thread that was posted by Emily Whitted, who is a PhD student who's studying historical knitting. So I follow quite a few fashion and textile historians and people who study material culture and that sort of thing. I've talked about Emily previously in the past couple of years. I first came across her Sometime during the pandemic, it was one of the many Zoom conferences that I attended that were largely academic conferences, but they welcomed anybody around the world. And she gave a really fascinating uh, presentation about um, 
American knitting manufacturing in the early uh, colonial times, which was something that I hadn't seen presented anywhere else. So she is American, but she's currently on a fellowship in the UK at the Framework Knitters Museum. So as part of her fellowship, she is visiting various different sites around the UK. Some of the sites she's visiting are places where they're using knitting to develop smart fabrics, or they might be a contemporary knitwear program, for example, while other sites house information about historical knitting machinery and the types of knitted items that were commonly manufactured in those parts of the UK um, in previous times. So if you'd like to see this thread, it's a series of photographs with little bits of information about where each of the things um, she encountered are located. Um, and I'll leave that down in the show notes. I am 95% of the way through the knitting of my 1940s sweater, according to my spreadsheet. So I need to finish this seventh triangle. This is the front and I've done six triangles. I'm partway through the seventh. The back of the sweater had eight sets of triangles, but with the front, I, instead of knitting the pattern the way it was written, which is to knit the front and the back exactly the same and then end up with this very kind of straight across boat neck. I decided to remove the eighth triangle and create more of a little bit of a scoop. I should be able to finish the knitting of the front this weekend. And then of course I'll have to do the washing, the blocking, weaving in ends and sewing up seams. But I have one thing that I'm kind of pondering about right now, and that's exactly what I'm going to be doing along the shoulder seam here. So because it's, it's a close fitting neck, whether it was the original boat neck or the, the neck that I'm doing, it's a pretty close fitting neck, which means that the left shoulder seam is only sewn halfway. And then the rest of the seam is just left open in order to facilitate putting the sweater on. Well then, once the sweater's on, it's got to be closed up. So here's what the instructions say. Work a row of double crochet down each side of the shoulder opening and fasten with press studs. So this is one of those final instructions that can be really aggravating in a knitting pattern where you're, you, you know, they've given you ex all the instructions you need to actually knit the project and then they leave you with a very terse sentence at the end about what to do to finish it. And because it's not knitting, they're not giving you explicit instructions. So this is something that used to bother me when I was a new knitter because I didn't know how am I supposed to sew this together. I don't know what you mean by block. I don't know how to do that. Or it would say install, you know, zipper or something like that. And you're like, well, how do I do that? Over the years, I learned how to weave in ends in different ways, depending on the project, how to sew seams up in different ways, depending on the project. Uh, I learned uh, how to block things depending on what kind of project it was. I learned all those kinds of things. But every once in a while, I still get thrown by a finishing instruction like that because I've never had to do that particular thing. And I have a million questions about, well, do you mean for it to be done this way or this way or that way? I don't know. I can visualize a bunch of different uh, ways or in some cases I can't visualize at all what's supposed to happen. It's that not being able to visualize what the instruction means that got me into this whole long-term project of knitting a sweater from each decade um, from the 1890s to the 1990s. And that was because I'd read through a pattern for a lady's sweater that was published in the newspaper in 1906 and I thought, oh, I wonder if I'll understand the instructions. And I was like, oh, I can actually totally understand these knitting instructions. And I was a little thrown off by what was going on in the actual construction of it. And so I started drawing a schematic and I was able to visualize exactly how the sweater was going to look before it was seamed up. But then the very last sentence, the instruction of that particular sweater said something like, line the fronts with silk ribbon, sew the button and buttonholes. And I was like, what do you mean sew the buttonholes? Where? Like, usually you do buttonholes when you're knitting. Like, I didn't understand and I couldn't figure out 
what was going on. And that's what actually got me going on this whole project because I couldn't stand not knowing <laughs> what to do. And so I ended up knitting this sweater and then, and then I could see what was supposed to happen uh, once the sweater was actually knitted up and in large part because the fabric did some very unexpected things that I'd never seen before, but it was the behavior of the fabric that informed me of how I was supposed to do that final instruction. There are a couple of things about the last two sentences of this 1940s sweater. Uh, the first thing was that it said to, you know, to do a, an, a row of double crochet along each edge. And my first thought was, I wonder why they're doing double crochet instead of single crochet. And then I went, oh, because this is a British pattern. And in the UK, what they call double crochet is what we call single crochet here. So that they, they are doing single crochet, so I understand that. So sometimes, you know, you have, to, you have to be aware that there can be different terms on one side of the Atlantic versus the other, that different countries will use different labels for things. But this is a vintage pattern. And sometimes language changes enough that whatever it is that they mean, that word may or may not mean what it means to us today. The last sentence was to fasten with press studs. So I was fairly certain that this was what we would call a snap here in the US. In the UK, they sometimes they call those poppers. Snaps and poppers are the same thing. But the term press stud I wasn't completely sure if that was just sort of the their generic formal textile based language. If it was some a term that was used more commonly in the 40s than they use now, or if it meant something very specific. Because when I read the term press stud, it brings a picture in my head of a very specific type of snap. So if you think of men's tuxedos, formal dress, and they have these, you know, white shirts, they will use studs to close the front. They have buttonholes, but they don't have buttons. And so it's like a little piece of jewelry, sort of like a cuff link, only it's just, you know, one directional because you only have to see, you know, the outside, you don't have to see both sides of it like you would on a cuff link. So I think of those as shirt studs or dress studs or something like that. And so in my mind, a press stud would be the snap version of that, like you'd see on a Western shirt here in the US, where they don't, again, they don't have buttons on those shirts, but they have snaps and you can see this sort of decorative, it looks like a button. Sometimes they call them snap buttons instead. But to me, that was what I was thinking of. Maybe that's what a press stud is. That's the kind of snap where it's got two pieces to each half of the snap. The fabric goes in between there and then those two pieces are clamped together. Uh, they're not sewn on. So the kind of snap that I'm used to using in, in my own sewing is the kind that you sew on, those tiny little snaps that you might have at the top of the back of a dress. Like if you have an overlapping zipper, so you have the two pieces are overlapping, maybe you'd have a little snap there. And my thought was, geez, if I sewed that kind of a snap onto knitted fabric, it was so tiny and like trying to get it unsnapped, I just kept imagining the knitted fabric kind of pulling and yanking. And I didn't completely like that idea. So I wanted to kind of investigate what they actually meant, <laughs> what was in their mind in 1949, and then whether or not I wanted to use that or if I did want to do something differently. So I am worried about the stretch factor. So one of the things I'm thinking about is maybe using some sort of ribbon. Like I did, uh, Tuesday's video was on how you can stabilize the uh, fronts, uh, bands of a sweater uh, for buttons and buttonholes so that they don't stretch out vertically or horizontally. And that gives you something stable to sew, especially if it's a heavy button, you know, it just gives something to keep it from stretching. So I'm thinking that maybe I would do something like that along the edge just to keep it from stretching, to make it easier to pull the snaps apart, possibly. 
The other thing that isn't clear to me is whether the two edges, like if you have like the, the front of the sweater and the back of the sweater come up and you have that shoulder seam right there and they've got crochet on either, either side of the edge. Do they intend for you to put like the male half and the female half of the snap, both of them on the right sides so that they fold in like this to create kind of um, kind of a fake seam because the rest of the shoulder will have been, you know, unseen like that. Is that what the intent is? Or is the intent to put, to be more like a button band where you have one on the right side of one band and one on the wrong side of the other and then you overlap it like that in order to snap it shut. I did look at the photo on the pattern and I can see that there's a little gap up at the edge so but I can't tell from that gap what is actually going on and it also <laughs> just the way that picture looks it makes it look like the back part of the shoulder is on top and that that's what is gaping. And so, and I, I, and my thinking is if you're going to overlap, you'd probably want to overlap the front part on top so that if there was a gap, it would show toward the back. So I'm sure I'm going to be playing with this over the course of the week. Yeah, I'm just not sure exactly what, what to do, but if anybody of you have done this, like for an adult sweater, what some kind of opening like this, I'd be curious about how you did it and what kinds of snaps you used as well. I don't think I want anything that shows visibly from the outside. I do think I want it to be hidden from view, but I'm just, I'm just not sure yet what it is I'm going to do. I do want to talk a little bit about this difference in crochet terminology. Uh, between the US and the UK because this question comes up a lot when people discover that the UK and the US do they have pretty much all of the same labels they just don't apply them to the same technique so in the in the US we have like the chain stitch so you create a chain and then they have slip stitch and then we have single crochet and then double crochet and treble crochet etc but in the UK they have chain stitch slip stitch and then they go directly to double crochet so that what they call double crochet is what we call single crochet it's kind of like that sort of label offset that you see with moss stitch where we have something we call seed stitch and and then we have moss stitch and we have double moss stitch and in the UK they have they start with moss stitch that's what we call seed stitch and then what we call moss stitch, they might in some cases call double moss, but often Irish moss. And then what we call double moss, they would call box stitch. So moss stitch is the same and it's in the same family of stitches, but you have to ask for clarity if somebody says moss stitch. So the question about this difference often assumes that the U.S. veered away from whatever the established standard was. Like, why did the U.S. change to this? It's not always phrased like that, but there's this, this question about it. And a lot of times there is this underlying assumption that the U.S. Decided, decided to do something different. The truth is that crochet was really, the way we know crochet today was really developed in the early 19th century. And the first crochet patterns were published around 1820, 1822, something like that, which coincidentally is the first published knitting books, knitting patterns, and sewing patterns were also published around the same time. So there wasn't any sort of established standard at that time. You were learning these things, you know, one person to another. And so the words that one person might use might not be the words somebody else would use. It wasn't like communicated throughout the world. There was no international standards organization establishing what these terms were. It took most of the 19th century just to sort of figure out how to present these sorts of instructions to people, like what is useful, what's confusing, uh, what is helpful, what makes the most sense. So there was no there was no standard. It really varied from book to book, no matter what country you were looking at. And it wasn't until the 1880s or so that the UK decided to kind of standardize what they were doing. In the US, we just took a little bit longer. There were some publications that did follow the British standard up until 
through the end of World War I. By the end of World War I, pretty much everybody had, had switched over to what had become the standardized way of doing it here in the US. So I wanna go to the overhead. I wanna show you some of the vintage and antique books I have and how the different stitch patterns were presented in different ways in different time periods. So this little book, this Encyclopedia of Needlework, was written by Therese de Dillemont. She was born in Austria. She had this entire, I think she had a sewing school as well as an entire chain of needle workshops throughout Europe. So this was published, I think, around 1890, and it was translated into various languages. So if we look here, is where she's got the crochet work. So let me zoom in. So here she is talking about what she, she's, there's two different terms for it, single stitch or small close stitch. And that's what we today would call slip stitch. And then right here, she's got what she calls plain or close stitch. So that was small close stitch and this was close stitch, or you could think of it as single stitch or plain stitch. And so this is what we would call here in the US single crochet, but in the UK these days they call it double crochet. So then you get a whole bunch of other stitch patterns. You can read this uh, book. I'll leave a link down in the show notes. This is on archive.org. It's, it's in the public domain, so you could look at this yourself. Um, but she's got all these variations that she calls like rose stitch and ribbed stitch and PK stitch and slanting stitch. She's got a whole bunch of them. And basically, they are single crochet, what we in the US would call single crochet, but it might be always worked from the same face of the fabric. And, uh, or it might be something where you're working back and forth, but you're only working uh, through like the back leg of a, of a stitch, or you're always working with the same side showing and you're working through the back loop. So she gives different names to all of those different variations where today, here in the US, we'd say single crochet in the round through the back loop. You know, that, like we would, here, here's the stitch you do and then here are the variations on it. But we wouldn't give it a name like rose stitch or ribbed stitch or whatever, which doesn't really inform you of what it is you're really trying to do. Um, but what I think is interesting is that this is called single stitch. That to me is interesting. She does eventually move on to, uh, she's got plain stitches, loop stitch. She eventually gets to half troubles, plain troubles and, and things like that once she, um, when she gets further in here, but she never talks about a double anything in this particular book. So here in the US, there were a couple of big yarn companies toward the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century. Fleischer's was one of them and they published uh, in the 20th century, they would publish these paperback books just about every year that were full of patterns. But this is the first one they published, and this one was hardcover and it was published in 1893. And if we look at this one, they have chain stitch, and there's a foundation of all crochet, single crochet or SC, put the needle in a stitch of the work, bring the yarn through and through loop on needle at the same time. So what they are describing here is slip stitch. And then the double crochet that they are listing here, put the hook in the stitch, bring the yarn through, then yarn through two stitches on the work. So this is what today we would call a single crochet in the US, but the UK would call this double crochet. So to me, this is really interesting that that first book talked about single stitch, and then this one is calling that single crochet. Uh, and that might be why we don't have a single crochet in the UK, is because they, they call it slip stitch the same way we do here. So to me, that, that was interesting. So this is the first edition. This is the very first Fleischer's uh, book, and this was published in 1893. This is the Columbia book of the use of yarns. This is their second edition. It was published in about 1901 or two. So this is the kind of paperback book that you would see after 1900. And what they, they have the chain stitch and then they say to slip a stitch. So they're describing what we today would call a slip stitch, but they're calling it 
to slip a stitch and then we get into the single crochet double crochet so this is the columbia book of yarns but i do have another fleischer's knitting and crochet manual this one is i think their sixth edition and it was published in like 1906 so this was published you know 13 years after the first one and there were a number of editions in between but in this one we do have instructions for chain stitch and single crochet and then they have double crochet treble long crochet pico or pico they have a whole bunch of things and they never do in this one talk about slip stitch ever which i think is interesting they have switched from 1893 to 1906 they have switched of the what they mean by single crochet so I think that's an interesting insight into what was going on between 1890 and like 1910 in, um, in books that were published, not just in the US, but also all over Europe, that there, there was variation from place to place. And it could be that the reason that the UK doesn't use the term single crochet is because that maybe was single stitch previously before they decided adopted the term slip stitch. So, um, so anyway, that is my little lesson on the difference between crochet in the UK and the US. Last week I showed you the collection of stockings I bought at an auction a couple of months ago. There were a lot of comments and questions about the stockings and with one burning question in particular <laughs> that came up over and over. Uh, one of the questions that I have had myself was where these stockings came from. Uh, I didn't know if they came from a museum or a university collection because no information was included in the shipment. So I emailed the owner of the auction house to ask if anything was known about the stockings and like if he could tell me where they came from. And he said that they came from a private collection and that typically if anything more is known about an item, like if it came from a museum or something, they do pass that information along to the new owner, but there was nothing more known um, about where these stockings originated. So the burning question that just about everybody in the comments had was uh, what these little ties were at the tops of the stockings. So I had never seen ties like that in photographs of 19th century stockings. So this was something I wondered as well. I, I, I wondered, had I just never noticed these sorts of little chains in previous photos, or maybe they had tucked them out of the way for the photography. But I looked and looked and looked online and I couldn't find any photos of stockings that included them. So I think this is something that was unique to this particular knitter. Um, so the question was, was it done for a practical reason, an aesthetic reason, or some combination of that? So I'm going to go to the overhead and, and give you a little bit closer look at uh, what those little chains look like. Some people were speculating that they were used to keep the stockings on the legs, but they're really too short. They're only a couple of inches long. There, there, there doesn't seem to be any practical purpose in terms of keeping the stockings up. Uh, I think if you look that the, this has this red and white yarn around the top. It's the same red yarn that was used here. I think she was using a, a two strands of yarn in order to do the cast on to create some durability to that. I'm not completely sure what cast on method she uh, used. I'm still looking at it, but it definitely was a double stranded one. So there may have been multiple yarn tails. Um, here at the starting point um, because if, if you were starting and ending with a double strand you'd have extra yarn tails uh, to weave in and so it could be that the starting and ending the double stranded yarns uh, were separate and that she joined a new strand to actually knit uh, the stockings and so she had because these always have an odd number of strands here and then she just braided those all together rather than trying to weave all of those ends into the same place in the back of the stocking. So it could have been a practical uh, in, for that reason that there's just too much to try to weave in. And maybe she just liked this, like she liked having a little tassel on uh, her stockings. It doesn't matter if nobody else was able to see them. But another, another 
thing that people were speculating is, oh, it could help you match up your stockings together. They tied them together. But you know, these stockings were all, you know, pretty wildly different in terms of color combinations, and they were all numbered, that each pair was numbered. So that doesn't seem like it would be necessary. And then some other people were suggesting maybe they tied to get them together so that when you're hanging them to dry, that could help them. Now these are all cotton, and which is heavy, and would be even heavier when wet. And I don't know if that, I mean, that seems like that would distort them while they were hanging um, to dry to do that. It doesn't mean they, they weren't, it wasn't done that way. It just, I don't know how practical that is. So I think that there was a practical use for having this, you know, double-stranded edging, but then dealing with all the, the yarn tails that would have been all in one place. Um, maybe that was uh, the, the practical reason for doing this. And then just, it's kind of a little bit of whimsy to have that um, tassel hanging down the back of the stocking. There were some questions about, you know, people curious about the kind of bright colors and fabulous designs and why, why that would be back in the 1860s, given that women had really long skirts. And the answer to that is just because people didn't see your stockings, your underwear, whatever, it didn't mean that that they weren't decorated or embroidered or, or something that was fun. But apparently I, it was something that was pretty popular in the 1860s. This was a, something that was popular with these really bright, colorful stockings. I was actually curious about the length of them. I uh, expected them to be a little bit longer. You know, when I hold them up to my own leg, they, they're basically like knee sock length. And I would have expected them to be longer so that you could tie a garter around above, just above your knee or just below your knee and so that the tops could then be rolled over. So I, maybe she's just really, it was really short. And so the stockings did go over her knees. Oh, and there was also a question about uh, whether I had tried the stockings on. As of last Friday, I hadn't. I'd wanted to because I'd read the dimensions and I thought, well, the foot is probably a little bit short compared to my foot, but only like maybe a quarter of an inch. I was worried about the height of the heel. I have a very high instep. And so that circumference from the base of my heel around to where my, the top of my instep, where my leg meets my foot, that circumference is, is quite long. And I usually have to modify sock patterns for myself to account for that. So I was a little worried about that. And I also, I didn't know how to try them on without like transferring skin cells or oils or whatever. You know, I just, I, I wasn't sure what to, what to do about that. And somebody in my Ravelry group mentioned something about like pantyhose or something. And I thought, oh, I have some knee high stockings down in my sock drawer. So I went and I put on a knee high stocking and then I chose one of the plain stockings. There's two pairs of just the plain kind of white stockings. And I chose one of those and uh, I tried them on. They fit really well around the calf. They were huge around the ankles. And I think because they were so big around the ankle, that gave me enough room uh, along the instep. One of the things that I noticed that has had bugged me about all of these uh, stockings was that if I, if I hold this up here, you can see how there's that, that back leg seam and it kind of wraps around here. So there's this column of pearl stitches or garter stitches that was very typical of the 19th century. They called it a seam line. And it was it was how you could keep track of the beginning of the round. And also if you when you were doing shaping in the leg, like decreases as you were working down, you can make sure they were in the right place. And then if you had that column of, of garter stitch or pearls, it would help you keep track. If you're trying to do something every six rounds or every 10 rounds, it was easy to count and tell where you had done it before. But that is meant to go up the back of the leg. And all of these had they were they were folded so that the that, that that seam was twisting around you know the the leg and when i tried the stocking on i thought well i want to line up that seam so that it's up the back of my leg and that's when i realized oh these initials and numbers are centered across the front of the leg 
And so if you wanted to display them so that you could see the initials and the number, you'd have to kind of twist them to do that. If we look at this one right here, it didn't have a seam line. It was just used a different gauge, a different size needle as, as they went down the leg. But this one is actually folded right up the back. And you can see that the initials here are on each half of the stocking here. So, but most of the stockings that were knit just in stockinette were, have been folded so that they can be presented when you're looking at them so that you can see the initials and the numbers. I'm pretty sure these uh, stockings are going to be a continuing adventure for me. The more I study them and uh, the more I learn about uh, how they're constructed. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.